Orson Welles, There Ain't No Way. Pauline Kale's review of Falstaff chimes at midnight. And please see the description for some other uh, Pauline Kale herself interviews on YouTube. What makes movies a great popular art form is that certain artists can, at moments in their lives, reach out and unify the audience, educated and uneducated, in a shared response. The tragedy in the history of movies is that those who have this capacity are usually prevented from doing so. The mass audience gets its big, empty movies full of meaningless action. The art house audience gets its studies of small action and large inaction loaded with meaning. Almost everyone who cares about movies knows that Orson Welles is such an artist. Even audiences who don't know that Welles is a great director sense his largeness of talent from his presence as an actor. Audiences are alert to him, as they often were to John Barrymore, and later to Charles Lawton, as they sometimes are to Betty Davis, as they almost always are to Brando, actors too big for their roles, who play the clown, and not always in comedy, but in roles that, for an artist of intelligence, can only be comedy. Like Brando, Wells is always being attacked for not having fulfilled his prodigious promise. But who has ever beaten the mass culture fly-by-night system of economics for long? What else could Wells do with his roles in Black Magic, or Prince of Voxes, or The Black Rose, or Trent's Last Case, but play them as comedy? Could one take such work seriously? The mediocre directors and the cynical hacks got money when he couldn't. His ironic playing is all that one remembers from those movies anyway. Like Brando, he has the greatness to make effrontery a communicated, shared experience which lesser artists had better not attempt. It takes large, latent talent to tell the audience that you know that what you're doing isn't worth doing, and still do it better than anyone else in the movie. Waiting for a train in Grand Central Station recently, I was standing next to a group of Negroes. To everything that they talked about, one of them, a young girl, said, There ain't no way, and it fit perfectly each time. Orson Welles' Falstaff came and went so fast there was hardly any time to tell people about it. But it should be back. It should be around forever. And it should be seen. It's blighted by economics, and it will never reach the audience Welles might have and should have reached. Because there just ain't no way. So many people, and with such complacent satisfaction almost, one would say delight, talk of how Wells has disappointed them, as if he had willfully thrown away his talent through that lack of discipline which is always brought in to explain failure. There is a widespread notion that a man who accomplishes a great deal is thus a genius who should be able to cut through all obstacles. And if he can't, and who can? What he does is too far beneath what he should have done to be worth consideration. On the contrary, I think that the more gifted and imaginative a director, the greater the obstacles. It is the less imaginative director who has always flourished in the business world of movies, the adaptable, reliable fellow who is more concerned to get the movie done than to do it his way, who indeed, after a while, has no way of his own, who is as anonymous as the director of Prince of Foxes. And the more determined a man is to do it his way, or a new way, the more likelihood that this man, quickly labeled a troublemaker, or a difficult person, or self-destructive, or a man who makes problems for himself, standard Hollywoodese for an artist, and of course, always true at some level, and the greater the artist, the more true it's likely to become, won't get the support he needs to complete the work his way. In the atmosphere of anxiety surrounding him, the producers 
may decide to save the project by removing him or adding to or subtracting from his work, or finally dumping the film without publicity or press screenings, consigning it to the lower half of double bills. All these things have happened to Wells. Citizen Kane was not big enough at the box office, and it caused trouble. He was not allowed to finish his next picture, The Magnificent Ambersons. Treatment of this sort, which usually marks the end of great movie careers, was for Wells the beginning. Most of these things have happened to men as specific as Jean Renoir, who few could accuse of being undisciplined. Renoir turned to writing a novel, his first in 1966, when he could not raise money to make a movie, though the budget he required was less than half that allotted to movies made to be premiered on television. And they are still happening to men in Hollywood like Sam Peckinpah. Such men are always blamed for the eventual failure of whatever remains of their work, while men who try for less have the success and are forgiven their routine failures because they didn't attempt anything the producers didn't understand. Joseph L. Mankiewicz's Julius Caesar was considered a success, and Orson Welles' Othello a failure. The daring of doing Shakespeare at all was enough for Mankiewicz and his producer, John Houseman, who was to be ritualistically referred to as the distinguished producer John Houseman, because of this film, not from his early theater work with Orson Welles, much as George Schaefer is referred to as the dignified director because of his speciality of embalming old war horses for television. Mankiewicz's luck held good on Julius Caesar. It's perfectly suited to the small screen where it recently appeared, while Welles's Othello, with its disastrous and perfectly synchronized soundtrack, isn't even intelligible. How could it be? A movie shot over a period of four years, with Wells dashing off periodically to act in movies like The Black Rose to earn the money to continue, and then his cast scattered, trying to make a soundtrack, reading half the roles himself, not only Rodrigo, but, if my ear is to be trusted, parts of Iago, too. Selecting long shots and shots with the actors' backs to the camera to conceal the sound problem. This, of course, looked like affectation. And his splendid, flawed production, visually and emotionally a near masterpiece, was a failure. Earlier, working on a Republic Pictures budget for Republic Pictures, Wells had shot his barbaric Macbeth, marred most by his own performance, in twenty three days because no one would give me any money for a further day's shooting. In the early fifties, Wells, as an actor, was in top flamboyant form. Nobody seemed to enjoy the sheer physical delight of acting as much as he, in roles like his M Lord Montedrago in Three Cases of Murder. Still very young, he played like a great ham of the old school, which was marvelous to watch in his father Mapple in Moby Dick, and in The Roots of Heaven. This lesser talent that he could live on was a corollary to his great talent. It was a demonstration of his love of, and prowess in, traditional theater, like the way Vittorio De Sica, also an actor from adolescence, could go from being the romantic singing star of Italian musical comedy to make shoeshine and then, back again, he too, to raise money for his own films, to playing in an ornate style, Gina's Lawyer or Sophia's Papa, a whole Barzini gallery of glory-ridden, mustachioed Italians. But Wells was beginning to turn into America's favorite grotesque. Like Barrymore and Lawton and Brando, he seemed to be developing an obsession with false noses, false faces. He had once, at least, played a role in his own face, Harry Lyme in The Third Man. By the sixties, he was encased in makeup and his own fat, like a huge operatic version of W. C. Fields. Audiences laughed when he appeared on the screen. 
He didn't need to choose the role of Falstaff. It chose him. When Wells went to Europe, he lost his single greatest asset as a movie director, his sound. He had already lost the company that talked together, the Mercury players he had brought to Hollywood, Joseph Cotton, Agnes Moorhead, Everett Sloan, and all, who were now working separately. Wells had first skyrocketed to public attention on radio, and what he had brought to movies that was distinctively new was the radio sound, with an innovative use of overlapping dialogue, which was used for trick-shot purposes, almost playfully, in Citizen Kane. But by the time of The Magnificent Ambersons, he was using this technique for something deeper. The family bickering was startling in its almost surreal accuracy. The sound was of arguments overheard from childhood, with so many overtones they were almost mythic. Wells himself had a voice that seemed to carry its own echo chamber, somehow in becoming the whiz kid of vocal effects, in simulating so many deep, impersonal voices, he had emptied his own voice of emotion. And when he spoke the credits at the end of The Ambersons, audiences laughed at the hollow voice, and perhaps at the comic justice of the spoken credit. Ironically, sound, the area of his greatest mastery, became his worst problem as he began to work with actors who didn't speak English, and actors who did but weren't around when he needed them, for the post-synchronization, which is standard practice in Europe, because the actors don't speak the same language, and is becoming standard here, too, because it saves shooting time. Wells compensated by developing greater visual virtuosity. Yeats said, Rhetoric is heard, poetry overheard. And though I don't agree, I think I see what he means, and I think this assumption is involved in much of the rejection of a talent like Wells's. His work is often referred to as flashy and spectacular, as if this also meant cheap and counterfeit. Wells is unabashedly theatrical, in a period when much of the educated audience thinks theatrical flair vulgar, artistry intellectually respectable only when subtle and hidden. Wells has the approach of a popular artist. He glories in both verbal and visual rhetoric. He uses film theatrically, not stagily, but with theatrical bravado. He makes a show of the mechanics of film. He doesn't, if I may be forgiven the pun, hide his tracks. Movies gave him the world for a stage, and his is not the art that conceals art, but the showman's delight and the flourishes with which he pulls the rabbit from the hat. This is why he was the wrong director for the trial, where the poetry needed to be overheard. I think that many people who enjoy these flourishes, who really love them as I do, are so fearfully educated that they feel they must put them down. It's as if people said he's a mountebank, an actor showing off. But there's life in that kind of display. It's part of an earlier theatrical tradition that Wells carries over into film. It's what the theater has lost, and it's what brought people to the movies. Wells might have done for American talkies what D. W. Griffith did for the silent film, but when he lost his sound and his original verbal wit, he seemed to lose his brashness, his youth, and some sense of his vitality. And he lost his Americanness. In Europe, he had to learn a different, more exclusively visual language of film. An enfant terrible defeated ages fast. At fifty-one, Wells seems already the grand old master of film, because, of course, everybody knows that he'll never get in the position to do what he might have done. Governments and foundations will prattle on about excellence, and American film companies will rush to sign up Englishmen and Europeans who have had a hit, hoping to snare that magic money-making gift. 
and tired transplanted Europeans will go on making big, lousy American movies, getting financed, because they once had a hit, and maybe the magic will come back. And Wells, the one great creative force in American films in our time, the man who might have redeemed our movies from the general contempt in which they are, and for the most part rightly held, is ironically an expatriate director whose work thus reaches only the art house audience. And he has been so crippled by the problems of working as he does, he's lucky to reach that. The distributors of Falstaff tested it out of town before risking Bosley Crowther's displeasure in New York. You may want to walk out during the first twenty minutes of Falstaff. Although the words on the soundtrack are intelligible, the sound doesn't match the images. We hear the voices as if the speakers were close, but on the screen the figures may be a half mile away or turned from us at some angle that doesn't jibe with the voice. In the middle of a sentence, an actor may walk away from us while the voice goes on. Often, for a second, we can't be sure who is supposed to be talking. And the cutting is maddening, designed as it is for camouflage, to keep us from seeing faces closely, or from registering that mouths which should be open and moving are closed. Long shots and Shakespearean dialogue are a crazy mix. It's especially jarring, because the casting is superb and the performance beautiful. It's not hard to take Shakespeare, adapted and transformed by other cultures, like Kurosawa's Throne of Blood, a Macbeth almost as much related to Wells's as to Shakespeare's, but the words of Shakespeare slightly out of sync. This is as intolerable as those old prints of Henry V that the miserly distributors circulate, chewed up by generations of projection machines, crucial syllables lost in the splices. The editing rhythm of Falstaff is at war with the rhythm and comprehension of the language. Wells, avoiding the naturalistic use of the outdoors in which Shakespeare's dialogue sounds more stagey than on stage, has photographically stylized the Spanish locations, creating a theatrically darkened, slightly unrealistic world of angles and low beams and silhouettes. When this photographic style is shattered by the cuts necessary to conceal the dialogue problems, the camera angles seem unnecessarily exaggerated and pretentious. But then, despite everything, the angles, the doubles in long shots, the editing that distracts us when we need to concentrate on the dialogue, the movie begins to be great. The readings in Falstaff are great even if they don't always go with the images, which are often great too. Wells has brought together the pieces of Falstaff that Shakespeare had strewed over the two parts of Henry IV and the Merry Wives of Windsor, with cuttings from Henry V and Richard II, and fastened them into place with narration from Hollinshed's Chronicles, read by Ralph Richardson. Those of us who resisted our schoolteacher's best efforts to make us appreciate the comic genius of Shakespeare's fools and buffoons will not be surprised that Wells wasn't able to make Falstaff very funny. He's a great conception of a character, but the charades and practical jokes seem meant to be funnier than they are. The movie does, however, provide the best Shakespearean comic moment I can recall, Garrulous Falstaff sitting with Shallow, played by Alan Webb, and Silence, played by Walter Chari, rolling his eyes in irritation and impatience at Silence's stammer. But Wells's Falstaff isn't essentially comic. W.C. Fields' Micawber wasn't either. These actors, so funny when they're playing with their own personae in roles too small for them, are not so funny when they're trying to measure up. The carousing and roistering in the tavern doesn't seem like such great fun either, though Wells and the cast work very hard to convince us it is. Oddly, we never really see the friendship of Prince Hal, played extraordinarily well by Keith Baxter. 
and Falstaff, the lighter side in Henry the Fourth, Part One, is lost. Probably well lost, though we must take it for granted in the film. What we see are the premonitions of the end. Hal taking part in games that have gone stale for him, preparing himself for his final rejection of his adopted father Falstaff, in order to turn into a worthy successor of his father the king. And we see what this does to Falstaff, the braggart with the heart of a child who expects to be forgiven everything, even what he knows to be unforgivable, his taking the credit away from Hal for the combat with Hotspur played by Norman Rodway. Falstaff lacks judgment, which kings must have. John Gielgud's Henry IV is the perfect contrast to Wells. Gielgud has never been so monkishly perfect in a movie. Wells could only get him for two weeks of the shooting, and the makeshift of some of his scenes is obvious. But his performance gives the film the austerity it needs for the conflict in how to be dramatized. Gielgud's king is so refined, a skeleton too dignified for any flesh to cling to it, inhabited by a voice so modulated, it is an exquisite spiritual whine. Merry England, Falstaff at least provides a carcass to mourn over. Wells as an actor has always been betrayed by his voice. It was too much, and it was inexpressive. There was no warmth in it, no sense of a life lived. It was just an instrument that he played, and it seemed to be the key to something shallow and unfelt even in his best performances, and most fraudulent when he tried to make it tender. I remember that once, in King Lear on television, he hit a phrase, and I thought his voice was emotionally right. It had beauty, and what a change it made to his acting. In Falstaff, Wells seems to have grown into his voice. He's not too young for it any more, and he's certainly big enough, and his emotions don't seem fake any more. He's grown into them, too. He has the eyes for the role. Though his Falstaff is short on comedy, it's very rich, very full. He has directed a sequence, The Battle of Shrewsbury, which is unlike anything he has ever done indeed unlike any battle ever done on the screen before. It ranks with the best of Griffith, John Ford, Eisenstein, Kurosawa, that is, with the best ever done. How can one sequence in this movie be so good? It has no dialogue, and so he isn't handicapped for the only time in the movie he can edit, not to cover gaps and defects, but as an artist. The compositions suggest Uccello, and the chilling, ironic music is a death knell for all men in battle. The soldiers, plastered by the mud they fall in, are already monuments. It's the most brutally somber battle ever filmed. It does justice to Hotspur's great, O oh, Harry, thou hast robbed me of my youth. Wells has filled the cast with box office stars. Margaret Rutherford, Jean Moreau, Marina Vladdy are all in it though the girl I like best was little Beatrice Wells as the page boy. And Falstaff is the most popular, crowd-pleasing character in the work of the most enduringly popular writer who ever lived. Yet, because of technical defects due to poverty, Wells's finest Shakespearean production to date, another near masterpiece, and this time so very close, cannot reach a large public. There ain't no way. Published in the New Republic, June 24th, 1967. Thank you for listening.